Hi, I'm Zachary Elwood, and this is the People Who Read People podcast, where we talk about understanding and predicting human behavior. You can read summaries of past interviews at readingpokertells.video slash blog. Today's episode is an interview of Dr. Rob Tarswell, who I talked to on August 6, 2020. This is the second time I've interviewed Dr. Tarswell. A few episodes back, I talked to him about his work analyzing SPECT brain imaging and correlating brain images with conditions affecting mental health. In this interview, I talked to Dr. Tarswell about his 15 years experience as a psychiatric doctor in emergency room settings. Topics we discuss include strategies for evaluating emergency room patients and distinguishing psychological conditions from other conditions, interesting experiences he's had attempting to evaluate patients, the nature of psychological illnesses, including how the surrounding environment and culture can influence delusions, the nature of self and consciousness, and how that relates to mental illness. How meaningful the names and categories we assign to various mental conditions really are, and the impacts of the language we use to describe these things. In my last interview for the podcast, I talked to Dr. Timothy J., an expert on cursing, about offensive and abusive behavior and the lesser known factors that could be behind that. In this talk with Dr. Tarswell, we talk about this topic too. We talk about some specific examples of people behaving badly. And Dr. Tarswell talks about mental health factors that can influence people to behave in offensive ways, including personality disorders and what exactly those are. Okay, here's the interview. Hey, Dr. Tarswell, thanks for coming on again. Hey, thanks for having me back. What kind of situations were, uh, did you see that were the most common? Was there a pretty consistent breakdown in the types of cases you saw? And what did that look like? The the, the broad categories of uh, case cases that would get referred in, in emergency room psychiatry, I'd say the, the majority would be an individual who is referred for suicidal ideation. That's the bread and butter of emergency psychiatric work. Along with that, there's referrals from individuals who have either acute emotional or behavioral disturbances. So acute psychosis is a common reason for referral. And then the Third broad category would be individuals who have expressed violent intentions towards other people. And quite often psychiatry gets involved in those cases where it's not clearly a police matter, or even sometimes if it is a police matter, then uh, psychiatry might still get involved if it's thought to be an expression or an outflow of an acute psychiatric emergency. Then after that, there's just there's, there's the, the broad mix of individuals in, in various types of crisis or individuals who are still intoxicated and behaviorally disturbed, but there's no acute medical emergency. So they are cleared by the emergency room, but not yet safe for discharge. And so they often end up in the care of psychiatry for reassessment once in a state of sobriety to determine whether there is a safety issue and then uh, sent on their way either on their own or off to rehabilitation or recovery services. It would seem, you know, with all the conditions that you'd be diagnosing or evaluating, there'd be a good amount of overlap between uh, different conditions, you know, between maybe substance abuse and a psychotic break or uh, Mm -hmm. between, I was reading about hypoglycemia and how that can look like, you know, catatonic depression or things like that. I know this probably is a pretty broad question, but what were the strategies you would use to try to evaluate someone quickly for these kinds of uh, common uh, behaviors areas? The the approach always tends to follow the same format. It's a bit like um, when you go, you know, you go, go flying, you never know what to expect, but you always have the same checklist. So an individual will come in to the front door and they'll be seen first by the triage nurse who will make a preliminary assessment whether the individual is in any medical distress or whether this is a psychiatric crisis without medical implications. And then the possibility existed of being directly referred to our service, or it would really depend on the physician's own comfort level. Some psychiatrists were comfortable taking patients directly from triage. Um, I didn't mind that. And then there were other psychiatrists who we're more like, well, you know, let's follow the usual pathway. Let's make sure this patient gets assessed by an emergency physician before uh, we get involved. My thought on that was I did go to medical school. I think if it's apparent to me that there's something that looks like a medical emergency arising, I can get 
preliminary blood work going and I can refer back to the emergency physician as needed. And ultimately, it may typically result in a patient being seen by a physician more quickly than if they would sit in the emergency room. Because one thing in, in Canadian emergency rooms, there's a triage score ranging from immediate life-threatening emergencies that come in that get seen right away. So that's that would be an individual in respiratory arrest or cardiac arrest. They go immediately to the front of the line. Then individuals, so that would be what we call a CTAS-1 or a Canadian triage assessment score. And then down two, three, and four. And most uh, individuals in psychiatric crisis, there's not an immediate threat to life or limb once they're in a contained environment. So they would be triaged either a three or a four. And so I'd be sitting in the psychiatric consultation office and you know, I could see out into the waiting room, uh, the patients waiting to be seen by psychiatry. And so it just made more sense to me. Well, all right, why don't I just get started with the preliminary workup? And if something arises, then we can get uh, get the emergency room physician involved. Did I answer your question? <laughs> yeah, uh, well, I'll, I'll follow it up. Uh, how often would you say it was that you were uh, uncertain about what someone's issue was and, you know, un- unclear whether it was due to, you know, substance abuse or um, right. intoxication or organic yeah. uh, disease? How, how often was that confusion present? Probably fairly regularly when I was a resident. That's in the phase of, of learning. And over time, you develop uh, a much better trained gestalt for the manifest ways that drug intoxication or drug plus alcohol intoxication can manifest or drug withdrawal. You get a sense for what a primary psychiatric disorder looks like versus Mm -hmm. a psychiatric disorder complicated by substance use versus, say, a psychiatric disorder, either primarily the result of substance use or a general medical condition or or the whole mix. You're, You're juggling all these balls all the time. And at, at some point it becomes internalized and you just kind of get this, you know, what you could call the, you got this mouse in your pocket and every once in a while the mouse crawls up your back and it breathes on the hairs in the back of your neck and you get to learn to listen to the mouse and you say, hmm, you know, why don't we get some blood work cooking on this individual or, hey, you know, maybe this isn't a panic attack and maybe we should get an EKG, things like that. Mm-hmm. Um, kind of a sixth sense. Yeah. And, um, you know, more often than not, it ends up being a, a false positive. So, the, you know, the blood works negative and it, it's just yet another uh, unusual manifestation of a psychiatric disorder because, you know, we certainly haven't seen all the varieties and, and combinations of human behavior. Um, right. But once in a while, you make a you make an important catch and uh, you're sort of like, OK, I'm, I'm, I'm really glad we caught that one. When you have those sixth sense feelings of like, oh, it's this or that. Do you feel like it's always something you can logically put your finger on and explain after the fact and say, oh, it was due to this thing that I noticed, even if I didn't notice it consciously, versus do you feel like sometimes it's just unexplained and and there was something you had a sense of that, you know, you couldn't actually find, uh, categorize later? Yeah, yeah. I mean, retrospectively, cases just about always end up making sense. There are still a few that years later, I just scratch my head and wonder what was going on and and still don't know. But 999 times out of a thousand, retrospectively, it all makes sense. It's it's prospectively, that's where you're really relying on intuition. And that comes down to very important fundamental steps that you just never want to miss. So did the patient get a set of vital signs from the triage nurse? Was there any preliminary blood work? What tests did the emergency physician order? Have those all come back yet? Did I take a careful history? Did I miss any aspects of the history? And often that's where you're going to get tripped up is, is missing the fundamentals. You can't, a lot of times you can take shortcuts and part of the path towards becoming a, a consultant is, is that sense of, of, what you can omit, at least for now, in the interests of efficiency, because the emergency room is often a very busy place. So that multi-layered approach from the triage nurse to the emergency physician, to the psychiatric nurse who does a preliminary assessment, then to the psychiatrist, you have a lot of layers to sift what the clinical issue or issues are before having to make a, a final disposition. Did you ever have any instance where you had kind of a sixth sense feeling about something very early on and and you you wondered why you felt that way and then you turned out to be right and you were surprised 
I would have to say that does come up once in a while. There are cases where something is just not adding up. I think one of the most spectacular examples I can think of was when I was in training, there was an individual, I was in in Nova Scotia, and uh, there are two bridges that cross the harbor from Halifax to to Dartmouth. And quite often, um, whether you were at the Nova Scotia Hospital in Dartmouth or whether you were at the QE2 Hospital in Halifax, you were assessing people who were brought in from the bridge. One morning, just the most weird case came in. This was a guy, he came in, he was wet. He claimed he had jumped from uh, the McDonald Bridge, swam to shore, and walked to the hospital. When we asked him, like, why had you done that? It was the, it was the day Christopher Reeve had died. And he said, I just couldn't imagine living in a world without Superman. And I mean, that was really, I found that something about that just, I found very moving. Right. But also he said, yeah, and my ankle's kind of sore. What was interesting is the, he'd kind of gotten brushed off by the emergency doctor because he was clearly walking around mm-hmm. and he was doing fine. Right. And, um, and I'm like, ah, the McDonald bridge, that's like, um, that's about 10 stories before you hit the water. That's a long way. Why don't we get an x-ray? And it turned out this guy had absolutely shattered his ankle. Mm. (laughs) uh, But one thing that's really unexplained, but clinically really interesting is individuals in acute psychotic states often have very different pain perception than, than, than you or I might have, or that they might have when they're in a state of recovery. It turned out that this guy needed emergency orthopedic surgery And we had to, the hardest part then ended up becoming persuading him to just stay off his, Mm. uh, his ankle because he just wanted to keep walking around because he was somewhat agitated. And then he, he did ultimately, um, get that surgery and then he was able to be safely admitted to the psychiatric unit or another time a patient got referred to our service. And one of my resident, uh, colleagues at that time noticed that there was just something not right. And then as she observed him more closely, noticed a very subtle asymmetrical facial droop and pulled out her reflex hammer and like, hey, I I think this guy might be having a stroke. And into the CT scanner he went, sure enough, uh, there was Mm. bleeding in his brain. So he called back, you know, I agree he's behaviorally disturbed, but I think he needs to see a neurosurgeon, not us yet. And um, so once in a while, those kinds of things do happen. So in that case of the the guy with the foot, um, could that also be the adrenaline of jumping off the bridge combination or something? Well, maybe, but the distance he had to walk to mm, our hospital right. was about 10, 10 kilometers or six miles in Yankee oh, talk. Wow. Yeah. And, and a lot of it is uphill <laughs> on, a, on a, on a shattered ankle. Yeah. Yeah. Just... And he just did it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, that's, that's the amazing thing about, you know, this, psychosis and schizophrenia type symptoms it's most people don't realize how much the pain perception can be just completely non-existent uh, right for, yeah, for com- yeah completely altered then another um and then just to kind of uh, as almost a, as a, a flip side um i remember when i was a, a junior resident on the inpatient service there was a patient i was working with on my six month rotation she was there the day i arrived she was there the day i left but there was this amazing window of about eight weeks in the middle of her admission. She fell and broke her hip. And as sometimes happens to uh, an elderly person, uh, hospital floors are hard. And through the process of, of surgery and recovery and physiotherapy, a completely different person emerged. She was no longer psychotic. She was organized. She was rational. She was participating with physiotherapy. She was doing her exercises. As her hip recovered, she slowly sank back into her really disabling, disorganized psychosis. And I remember one time having uh, just the most insightful conversation with her. And I can't duplicate her lovely Scottish accent. And I said, so what what's the reason that you think you're here in the hospital and have been for such a long time? And she just looks at me with these very compassionate eyes and says, oh, don't be silly. It's because I've got the skits. I've had it for years. And I mean, that and that was the the most direct conversation I ever had with her. And um, mm. yeah, yeah. After 
she went back into her disorganized state it was uh it was uh she, she was sort of gone again in that mm. sense it's wild how people can have that um that awareness you know mixed with going back and forth with the um not being yes. aware and there's something uh, I've noticed this, you know, several times, and I think a lot of psychiatrists would would report this. I'm sure it's been studied. It's not something that I've looked into the literature about, but psychiatric patients who get into desperate medical crisis, it's somehow able to exert an organizing or a rallying type of an influence. I, I worked with a patient for a while who was convinced that he was Satan and that he had to die in order to save the world. Otherwise, he was going to do something absolutely terrible. Unfortunately, one day while he was on a pass, a limited pass within the hospital that has a rooftop, or not a rooftop, but an upper level kind of a courtyard, which is at the top of a parking garage that's four stories up, he took the plunge over the side and completely shattered both of his legs and somehow survived. And he needed the intervention of multiple surgical experts. He needed orthopedics and urology and neurosurgery. He had just badly fractured his legs and his pelvis. Thankfully, he was young. He came through. But here was another guy who, while he was in the wheelchair, while he was recovering, cooperating with care, completely rational. And again, just watching him just sort of rally, but then descend back into the psychotic state after his injuries were in the clear and he was on his way in terms of the rehabilitation. It's mm. uh, heartbreaking and fascinating at the same time. One thing I haven't seen, I haven't read much about, but I wonder if you have an, a thought on it. It seems like the awareness of your strange mental condition can coexist with delusions and be present at the same time, because it seems like, you know, when you look at people with really scary delusions if they actually fully believe those delusions, there would be much more instances of them hurting people or hurting themselves. But there's a coexisting of, right. at some level, of them realizing, like, well, I shouldn't go too far with this, you know? I, yeah, I don't, yeah. I don't know if you have thoughts on that. but Yeah, so we subdivide that in psychiatry, and we make a distinction between insight, which is how connected you are with reality, sort of the, the consensus reality world that we all tend to operate in. Like, oh, that's a table over there. It is raining outside. Uh, I need money in order to pay for goods and services. Being in contact with reality or, or realistic, we call it, but not kind of in the usual sense of realistic. And distinct from insight is judgment. And judgment is the quality of your decisions. And you, you can have intact judgment despite having impaired insight or even completely absent insight. Of course, we all know people who have good contact with consensus reality and make absolutely atrocious decisions. So you can have very poor judgment and be uh, very well connected to, to reality in some sense. So when we describe an individual's mental state, we comment on their insight and then we comment on their judgment and whether their judgment is influenced or not influenced by their mm -hmm. uh, psychotic mental contents. Two dimensions. Yeah, I mean, that, that makes sense. I've never heard that talked about, but I've often wondered. It's kind of amazing when you look at the uh, sometimes just terrifying delusions and beliefs that, that some people have that worse things haven't happened to them, you know? And, and, and right, I, yeah. right. Yeah. You know, one thing that a lot of people have heard about, and it's sort of the so-called, you know, the sexy psychotic phenomenon would be like command hallucinations, which are a voice telling you to do things. And you talk, uh, one of my favorite conversations about this was with a forensic psychiatrist who was a mentor of mine. And he said, well, you know, the thing about command hallucinations, it's sort of like any idea. The less outlandish it is, the more likely you are to do it. If you have the command mm. hallucination saying, pick up the salt shaker and put it over there, well, you're probably just going to do that. But if you have the command hallucination telling you to assassinate a major political figure, mm, you know, you might be less More inclined obstacles. to, yeah, you, yeah. you might be less inclined right. to go along with that. So it just because it's there in the mental furniture doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to be especially obligated to rush out and act on it. Right. And I think uh, another aspect that I don't see talked about much too is, you know, there, there can be an element of not uh, of, of a person not actually believing the thing fully. And I think the reason it doesn't get talked about much is because it, it might imply that they're like, you know, faking it or choosing 
to do things despite knowing it's not real. But, I, you know, for example, like I talked to a, someone who uh, had a psychotic uh, experience episode and mm-hmm. he de- he described it as basically like choosing to go down this rabbit hole where he, uh, for whatever reason, he, he basically was doing a what if scenario like oh what if this is i'll live my life and make these decisions as if this thing were were true and i want to see in a sense he you know he he obviously wasn't in the best mental state but it it was also where he was you know acting as if this thing were true and entertaining the idea that it were true in this in the hopes that it would lead to something else and i think there's there can be all sorts of scenarios that don't imply that don't involve someone completely believing in a delusion that still makes them behave in in unusual strange ways right or the 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 flip side of that would be i it was an individual i encountered multiple times and he had perfectly preserved insight but would encounter such disturbing uh, hallucinations that they would drive him to almost immediate uh, suicidality. And typically he would say to me, look, um, I nearly drove my car off the road. I really think you need to admit me to the hospital or I'm going to do something really regrettable. And he was right, right? So we would you know, bring him into the hospital and um, help him kind of get back on the path to recovery. Mm-hmm. So that, that was the most striking example of preserved insight mm-hmm. in the face of an onslaught and yet feeling as though he had significantly diminished capacity in terms of action. So it, it can, it can be anywhere from sort of zero to 100 on the insight and the judgment axis. And there's a loose correlation, but there are so many exceptions. Mm-hmm. And it's like, you know, for all of us, we're, we're kind of, it's kind of like we all contain multitudes of, of viewpoints, you know, and and I think sometimes it's, there's this desire to boil it down to these simplistic, like, oh, this person has these X beliefs or delusions. But I think, you know, for all of us, we have combinations of, right. of viewpoints. You know, it's like we, we might try to kill ourselves and then all of a sudden not want to do that. You know, it's like we have these competing uh, views in, in us at yeah. all times, you know. Yeah, I like the uh, like uh, the philosopher Daniel Dennett uh, mm-hmm. puts mm-hmm. it. Yes, we have souls, but they're made of many tiny robots. <laughs> I mean, right. we have we have folk conceptions of ourselves as an internally coherent self and that there is a single narrative thread that can describe it. But that's a sort of a convenient user illusion that we have about ourselves. Mm-hmm. I think the reality of ourselves is, is vast and complicated and individuals in various states of psychiatric crisis really show us where the edges of that simple, smooth appearing surface actually are when, when those edges start to come apart. Right. I really like Dennett's uh, consciousness explained, and I, it really changed my way of thinking about consciousness and, and mind. Right. And, and, and I, I can really, you know, I can really see examples of of his theories, you know, when you just get these these inklings with your own mind sometimes of like how arbitrary sometimes a memory is and, yeah. and how it's just kind of like this boiling down of all these competing uh um, you know, things that, right. that uh, you're, it's, it's not this, uh, this one truth. It's a, it's a boiling down of all these competing narratives that are going on in your brain, all these activities in your brain, you know, it's a great yeah. book. Yeah. Yeah. And that, I mean, I, I sort of take from that, that this is probably in part the power of, of psychotherapy, which is to help individuals es- essentially rewrite their narratives mm. from mm. malignant towards more benign kinds of narratives that they're then less tortured by their own histories and able to function more effectively in the present. And the more I read about schizophrenic symptoms and psychosis, it it really seems to me that these are disorders of existential disorders. I mean, I know that's a controversial idea, but I think the, and I I, I still believe there's genetic uh, components too, but I I think how, you know, there's logic under the hood in the sense that there's these existential, uh, you know, for example, uh, not having a, a, a very coherent model of self, not having a coherent model of, mm-hmm. of reality. And, you know, even if there's genetic com- components, too, and, and people are predisposed to it, it, it right. the way they play out really seems like there there's some logic there under the hood in the sense that people are striving to make sense of a of these models that we take for granted that have ceased working for them, you know, models of, of how their self relates to the outside world and relates to others. Yeah, I, mean, like I, I think a, a simple way of thinking about this one year, it was a it was a really strange year, but I had three separate patients, unknown to each other, uh, 
over the course of the year, all convinced that they were the illegitimate love child of a former Canadian prime minister, Pierre Trudeau. Mm. Uh, his son, Justin Trudeau, is the current prime minister of Canada. And um, one thing that's problematic about that is if you attempt to approach a member of the Trudeau family, uh, you're going to be intercepted by an RCMP officer and it's not going to go well for you. And you're going to end up in front of somebody like me, which is what ended up happening in two out of three cases. Problem is I'm the guy that comes along and then starts treatment, antipsychotic medication, then attempting to kind of resituate you, you know, back in the, in the reality of your world. And it undeniably, there's something really, I mean, how amazing would it be for you to wake up tomorrow morning and realize that you were, say, a blood relation of Barack Obama? That'd be like, wow, that that's trippy. At the very least, that'd be really cool, right? It's, it's, it's ego, it's ego boosting. It's it's appealing in in various ways, yeah. And it's it's kind of an it's it's novelty, right? So there's this kind of novel aspect of it as well. And so I'm coming along, and my job is to kind of take away this thing for you that is is very organizing. It, it injects your life with meaning, and those parts I don't have a problem with. It's the the problem is when you get influenced by that belief to the point where you're a public nuisance or you are a nuisance to a particular family out in the community, right? Uh, that's where I, we kind of have to step in. But one thing that that we're learning more and more, and this is in particular, there's a, a, a colleague I work with, and she does a lot of qualitative research with individuals in the bipolar community, is that lots and lots of individuals with, say, bipolar disorder, and I assume this is probably true, across many psychiatric disorders, they don't want their symptoms to be completely relieved. There's an aspect of, say, mania that is a source of joy. It's a source mm -hmm. of energy. It's a source mm -hmm. of ideas and creativity. Right. But it also unchecked, instead of becoming like a breeze that turns a wind turbine that creates electricity, it's a tornado that rips apart a city. So there's this fine balance that she's discovering that that a lot of individuals are wanting to live with. Uh, they don't want to be completely squelched out by medication. They want some aspect of that. There's a there's an aspect of that that's fuel, even though the flip side is is the depression and the, the terrible dysphoric moods. And then on the the I had an individual once described to me who had auditory or sorry, visual not hallucinations, but illusions. And the difference, a, a hallucination is not linked with a percept. Whereas an illusion might be you hear a fan or, or somebody switches on a fan and you hear a conversation. So there's, there actually, there is objective stimulus that then gets confused or rearranged in some way that we don't, don't fully understand. Mm -hmm. So there was an individual who I was working with, who had visual illusions that, for instance, when she would look at playing cards, the kings, queens, and jacks would come to life and mm -hmm. would begin engaging with her and would just sort of see magic everywhere, leprechauns and fairies. And um, to an extent, that was benign, and she didn't want to have that go. But unfortunately, you know, the, the treatments we use to some degree are blunt tools, and they do tend to take those things away, or they can anyway. One thing I've often wondered is uh, how many mental um, conditions or, or emergency episodes are due or influenced by lack of sleep? Because I know I've read that lack of sleep obviously can have very disorienting eff effects on people. Mm -hmm. And I know that, you know, dealing with various types of mental distress can make you lose sleep. So what's your opinion on, on that connection? I certainly have seen no shortage of individuals who are experiencing insomnia near that often seems to be part of the final common pathway leading to the emergency room presentation when an individual is getting to the point where they cannot sleep anymore sleep maybe starts to go a little bit off early on but then by the time it's completely gone then yeah individuals who can't sleep they're often not having a good time and that greatly exacerbates everything right. so if you're depressed well, depression is a kind of an interesting exception. There's there's a, some interesting research that if you sleep deprive somebody who's depressed overnight, they'll feel better in the morning. But as soon as they sleep, 
they wake up and they're depressed again. Under research conditions, that's true. But lots of individuals who are depressed and a bit anxious and stressed out and the boss is on their case and they are having friction with their families when they can't sleep, that's kind of like, oh boy, now it's now I'm in real trouble. Now I need help. So there are individuals who their presenting complaint to the emergency room will be, I just can't get sleep and I need to get sleep. And they may not initially be identified as psychiatric emergencies, but as the, the emergency physician takes an interview, recognizes, oh, wow, this is a big pile of stressors. They'll work their way over to us. And certainly, you know, some of the most effective early interventions that I can offer somebody is to give them a good night's sleep. It doesn't sound like much, but wow, your perspective can change dramatically oh, yeah. if I give you a mild sedative and we can turn the lights down and you wake up in the morning and you're like, hey, you know, maybe I can find my way through this problem. It's nice when a simple intervention like that can have such a such an effect. And even individuals who uh, are in more significant states uh, who need to be admitted, the very first thing that we address is sleep-wake cycles, chronobiology, sleep-wake reversal is often really common with psychiatric disorders. It's certainly common with a lot of substance-induced psychotic disorders, like say from crystal methamphetamine. We'll have individuals coming in who maybe haven't slept in 21, 28 days on a really long crystal meth run. Mm. And okay, soon it won't be a problem for you to sleep, but we're going to have to get you to sleep for now. And that's the beginning of, uh, of recovery for, I would say, just about everybody. Yeah. I mean, just speaking from experience, I can, you know, I, I've dealt with major anxiety and, and depressive episodes and I've had panic attacks and, and I've also went through periods and uh, when I had really bad insomnia and just the fact that insomnia alone, you know, sleep deprivation can, can get you pretty close to even lead to a, you know, psychotic break on its own. It just seems like that could be a, a cycle of uh, making things worse, you know, yes, for, yes. for someone who's close to that anyway, and then they don't sleep for a while and then they have a psychotic break. And then, right. Uh, yeah. It just seems like a total cycle possible there. I've lost count of the number of times I've heard the story yeah, I took a lot of pills. I hadn't slept in four days. I just needed to sleep and I didn't care how it happened. So there can definitely be individuals who from sleep deprivation and the suffering that induces lose the will to live or mm -hmm. are not necessarily wanting to die, but are absolutely willing to accept that risk. If right. half the bottle of sleeping tablets will get me to sleep, if I don't wake up, oh, well, but I must sleep. They're so desperate. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah, sleep, sleep is absolutely important. I mean, I can even remember myself when I was on basic officer training in the, in the eighties, in my, my previous career, I was in the, uh, the air force in Canada and by about the third day out in the bush, right. Um, logs are becoming enemy soldiers or morphing into friendly soldiers and you talk to them and they don't talk back and you look again and it's a log and you're like, what mm -hmm. is happening? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the world becomes, when you're sleep deprived, the world quickly becomes pretty menacing. You know, it's, uh, and you can, you can get a sense of, uh, just from sleep deprivation, you can get a sense of what some of the schizophrenic um, feelings of uh, of uh, persecution or, or delusion are like just from sure. just from sleep de deprivation. Yeah. 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 When it comes to trying to distinguish if someone's under the influence of drugs, was it usually the case that people were pretty forthcoming and honest about that information? Yeah. It well, it really depends because if if an individual is paranoid, um, they may or may not tell you what they're using. But a lot of case in a lot of cases, if you are non-judgmental, you will just go ahead and ask them. Or the, the emergency physician often, if an individual, if their mental status looks impaired in some way and you can't get an adequate history, they'll just send off a urine drug screen. In Canada, mm. that's a $2 test. In America, <laughs> that's a different story, right? right. So, so uh, You're going broke, yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's a $2 test and nobody's, you know, and it's paid for by the public. So, and the public doesn't mind paying $2 for mm -hmm. a urine drug screen, especially if it reveals something that really important, uh, especially relating to not only the individual's current mental state, but what we can expect if, as they head into withdrawal from a particular mm -hmm. substance. And then a lot of it just ends up being clinical. You get to know what different uh, substance impairment syndromes look like. But there I should say, I never once had seen somebody who was 
intoxicated on classical psychoactive substances, so LSD or psilocybin from magic mushrooms. But then in one summer, I saw three. And it was the it was the a weirdly similar presentation in all three cases. One case, an individual was high on mushrooms and just felt compelled to just jump through the living room window. So I didn't see that person in the emergency room because they needed a lot of emergency surgery. I saw them up on the surgical floor while they were recovering and got this story. Another individual suddenly felt really confined in a car, had this overwhelming urge to jump from an overpass. Luckily, it was a low overpass, like only an 11, 12 foot one. And so they shattered an ankle, but otherwise were okay. And then a third person, very similar situation, just this urge to jump. All three of them had endorsed being at a um, at different music festivals because the, the hospital, Lionsgate Hospital, uh, not far from us is sort of Squamish, Whistler, and it's just music festival heaven all summer long. And it was the first time I'd ever seen anyone. And then one thing that's really nice is if you have relationships with people and you're non-judgmental, I, I, I was able to kind of reach out on an informal network and get information back from a friend of mine who uses and sells and said, um, oh yeah, yeah, none of the dealers are touching the mushrooms this year. They're all super potent. And mm. I'm like, okay, that's really interesting. interesting. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it, 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 it sort of helped me get towards a partial explanation, but it definitely, it didn't solve it. One thing I was curious about with psychedelics uh, and people doing bad things like the things you just described yeah would that almost always be people whose it was their first time you think or because it seems like having had that experience once you'd be more likely to to restrain yourself the next time like knowing what knowing what the psychedelic experience is like yeah, do you have yeah. any thoughts on that in the terms of the cases i saw i don't know whether these were first timers or not the, those details escape me now these cases are, are a few years old now well well back yeah I honestly don't know, but I, I, I'll definitely, I'll kind of pause and say, hey, kids, if you're going to be a psychonaut, don't fly alone. Make sure there's right. somebody there who's not using who can kind of be the guy. Yes. And you should doubt your, <laughs> doubt your ideas when you're, <laughs> if you're going to do that. Or what uh, did Timothy Leary say? If you think you can fly, start from the ground. <laughs> yeah. Tr test it out when you're sober. Um, something I've, uh, I've often wondered about you know, mental conditions in general is, you know, they seem to me to exist on this such a multidimensional spectrum that, you know, the the names that we give to the various conditions are are such a rough attempt to capture, you know, what are just these surface level descriptions. Yeah, 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 uh, yeah. Would you agree with that? And, and do you think, is there too much belief, do you think, in the public sphere that these are, you know, actual things that, you know, are the names that we use for things, these things are tied to very concrete right. uh, conditions. Does, does that make sense? No, I hear exactly what you're saying. So suppose you come to me and you've got, or I diagnose depression. Well, that means that you, um, you either have sustained low mood or loss of interests or both plus three or more of the remaining seven symptoms. So this is already a combinatorial nightmare. There are 128 ways to be depressed per, per DSM. Do we see all 128 types of depression in nature? Well, no, we don't. So just to look at the depression example, one thing that's, that's interesting is, all right, we've got this construct of depression. And these constructs come from years and years of clinical observation and research. But what are the true natural kinds of depression? What, what's the kinds of depression that we see out in the wild? And is there even such a thing as depression in the wild or generalized anxiety disorder in the wild? Or are these categorizations we're roughly applying to things that are not natural kinds? There's a constant discussion that's never going to go away. Or certainly, I don't, I don't see how it ever gets resolved because I think it's fundamentally irresolvable. And it's the been approach to psychiatry. Do you either you fit in this bucket or not? So here's the depression bucket. Here's the anxiety bucket. Or do you have a number of symptoms to varying degrees? So we diagnose you along various spectrums. Clinically, it's much, much, much easier to work with buckets. 
from a research perspective, it's much, much, much easier to work with scales. But when I'm, say, in, in the emergency room setting, it's probably good enough to say, okay, this de individual is depressed with some agitation. I know roughly what that means. I know what to expect broadly. I know what my approach is going to be. The psychiatric nurses know how to formulate an approach to that. The inpatient psychiatric unit knows how to approach that. Whereas, say, a, psycho a psychological researcher who might come along and want to administer detailed scales over a several hour interview might say, well, there's three out of 10 on symptom one and, 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 and so forth and so forth. And in a sense, what's interesting is as we look further and further, it does seem that there are some disorders which do tend to kind of cluster and that there are some disorders which if you kind of get too close to them, they seem to almost disappear like fog. Uh, personality disorders is one thing that's really interesting. Borderline personality disorder, which is frequently seen in the emergency room because individuals with borderline personality are very frequently or easily triggered into crisis. And they are often struggling with anxiety, with depression, with agitation, with substance use disorders, with chaotic relationships, with dangerous situations all the reasons that somebody might come in the front door of the emergency room. That's a disorder that does seem to cluster. It does seem to exist as a kind of a natural kind. Bipolar disorder seems to exist as a natural kind. And we can say broad things like depression, there's mild and there's moderate and there's severe kinds of depression, but we can't even really, for instance, separate the depression of major depressive disorder, which is just kind of normal mood, depressed mood, normal mood, depressed mood, from bipolar disorder, which has depressed mood, maybe normal mood, then hypomania or mania. So those depressions are completely inseparable, the depression of major depressive disorder, from the depression of bipolar disorder. So we have this category that we call depression, and yet we know that one in six times we toss someone in the depression bucket, that's probably a bipolar disorder, and if we put them on antidepressant medication, we're going to make them a whole lot worse. So it's actually a really clinically urgent question. How do we separate these folks? And no one has a good answer yet, but it's a, it's a constant source of investigation at a neurobiological level, at a clinical level. At, well, what about this symptom? Does this, is this symptom the clue? And we haven't yet, mm. we haven't yet found it. And, I, and the reason this interests me is because it seems like there can be a tendency for people, the people suffering from these conditions to, to use those, to think of those labels as, or those condition names as, as representing very precise or definitive yeah. states. You know, for example, it, it would be the difference between someone saying, I am a schizophrenic versus I have suffered from schizophrenia right. or yeah. someone saying I have borderline personality disorder or, or right. versus saying I've exhibited behavior that yeah. is described as borderline personality disorder. And, the, yeah. you know, I, I was watching a show documentary about borderline personality disorder. And, you know, I think, I think people crave labels, you know, that they're, they're comforted by having a label uh, to assign themselves. And, and it struck me in that, right. that uh, documentary I watched where someone was saying, I have borderline personality disorder, but I think a healthier, a healthier way to view it, you know, is to say, is to recognize that we, we can all exhibit these traits and yeah. conditions throughout our lives. Like we can change, you know, I might become something, you know, resembling a, a, a personality disorder later in life. It, you know, the, these things don't define us, but they're, they're states that we're, we're passing through. And I'm wondering if you, you think there's, there's power in the way that people use language in that way. Absolutely. And I think uh, psychiatry shares some degree of the blame here. Uh, I think one of the really positive movements in mental health and in health overall is person-centered language, which I think arose mm. from the disability movement. So I am not a schizophrenic. That's not the end of who I am. I am a person who has schizophrenia and sometimes I have active psychosis and that manifests in these particular ways. So I think that's one shift in kind of my own thinking over the last 10 years that's been really helpful and very destigmatizing as well, because it is, it is a completely normal phenomenon for individuals to encounter various kinds of cognitive, emotional, or behavioral disturbance in their lives, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. By the time we scatter your ashes to the winds, there's a one in two chance 
that you will have had a psychiatric episode over the course of your life. These things are as common, uh, not quite as common as cold viruses, but nearly. So that's been an important piece as well, because I think there's maybe a tendency within society where as well, if you are a schizophrenic, then you're over on that side of this great chasm and the chasm separates the sane from the insane. Right. And um, the reality is we're all somewhere on the high wire on the, right. <laughs> on the opposite right. shores, right? Um, so person-centered language has been one thing that's been really helpful. And also an analogy that I like to use with individuals in a therapeutic way, if I get the sense that they're maybe relying on a label in a way that's going to be maladaptive for them or dysfunctional is like, you know, it's like, it's like diabetes. Diabetes is a chronic lifelong condition and you got it. The question now is what are you going to do about it? Are you going to measure your blood sugar? Are you going to exercise? Are you going to do your best to make healthy diet choices? Are you going to follow up with the nurse and take your insulin as prescribed? And would you, if you were that diabetic person and eventually someone gets to the point where they'll go, well, yeah, yeah, of course. And I'd say, well, here's the good news. You don't have diabetes. You don't have a disease that's going to take 10 to 20 years off your life and maybe cost you your kidneys and your leg and your retinas. You have X, you have depression or you have bipolar disorder or schizoaffective disorder, you name it. And it also is a chronic condition and it's exacerbated by stress and it's relieved by recovery. And we have a program where you check in with a nurse and you take medication and you participate in recovery, but none of that can happen unless you take ownership of the thing, right? If we care more about your recovery than you do, you're never going to recover. So it doesn't matter what you call it. It doesn't matter how strongly you identify with it. The real question is, what are you going to do about it? What are you going to do about it? And what is the rest of your life? What do you want it to look like within the bounds of what's possible for you? And what can we do to help you hit those targets? And that those kinds of conversations end up being really common to kind of help individuals to try and grant individuals autonomy and power over their conditions uh, in the same way that a, you know, an endocrinologist would try and grant autonomy to say like a 17 year old with a new diagnosis of type one diabetes. Your reference to um, the power of the word schizophrenia, for example, um, mm. there was a great book uh, by Nathan Filer. I guess that's how you say his last name. It's called Heartland, Heartland Finding and Losing Schizophrenia. Mm -hmm. And he, uh, he takes the approach of, you know, he makes a really strong case that, like you said, these are spectrums that are part of human nature in a sense and, and can just be on the more extreme side for people with, uh, he calls it so-called schizophrenia. That's the approach he takes in the book. And he makes a really strong case for how these things like we like to treat as this, this, this condition, this set thing and the language that we use for it, where it's really this spectrum of, of various things that can go wrong with people, you know, and that right. we all to an extent deal with some of it, but, you know, obviously it's just much more extreme for some people. Right. Um, that book was really great and, and, and changed my way of thinking about a, a lot of mental health. And actually, I think, I think he changed the title of it because initially um, one of the titles for it, it was, uh, this book will change the way you think about mental illness, I think was the initial title. And then there's another, I meant to bring this up earlier when we were talking about the, the role of um, culture and, and the en environment uh, on delusions when you mentioned the people that mm. had this similar delusion of uh you know trudeau being their their father there's yeah. a great book called uh, suspicious minds by joel and ian gold their their brothers it's it's about the role of culture and environment on our delusions you know they talk about the yeah. truman show delusion which you know gained prevalence uh probably due to our you know our, our modern environment of of always being uh, surveilled every, every cameras everywhere and, and feeling right. like we're being watched. And that book was really good too. And uh... well, what's interesting is, yeah, if you look at nation level studies of individuals with chronic uh, psychotic symptoms or chronic delusions, these vary uh, country by country. And so here we are in North America where we're used to hearing about paranoid delusions, persecutory delusions, and in a sense, it's reflective of, of culture at large. You know, I think America and Americans in particular are pretty famous around the world for hating the government, being very suspicious of each other, 
carrying guns. There's a very leave me alone or else kind of a valence, earned or not. That Don't kind tread of, on me. That, yeah, that kind of a, an American valence. And it's not too surprising that this ends up getting reflected in persecutory ideation of government surveillance is really common. Whereas if you go to India, a lot of an individual's delusions are things like, you should be more helpful in the family. You should do the laundry. The, these, these kinds of ide- these collectivist ideas about pitching in. And so there's this, this, don't get me wrong, right? Individuals who have psychotic disorders, these are disabling disorders. They're chronic disorders. They wax and wane, but often they are lifelong disorders. But there are, there are aspects of them that are different, that, that make for different kinds of management issues in different countries. You're saying some present a, a harder to handle, more aggressive problem than how they would present right. in, a, in a different culture. Right. So that, this is probably a good segue into uh, the last person I interviewed for the podcast was Dr. Timothy Jay, and we talked about verbally uh, aggressive and offensive behavior. And I'd imagine as an ER doctor, you've dealt with your fair share of people uh, <laughs> oh. behaving uh, in aggressive ways towards you. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the nice thing is, uh, as the emergency psychiatrist, often I'm sort of the last person in a chain. And mm, by the right. time I get there, uh, right, the police have been involved and gone home. The emergency physician has sedated the person. They've, they've ended up so with chemical restraint, maybe physical restraint, and so forth. And by the time I'm seeing them, they're 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 waking up, they're groggy, they might still be partially restrained to a bed, and they're often in a much different headspace than they were the night before, which is kind of entirely appropriate anyway, because I can't assess somebody who is simply just screaming and fighting. I'm not going to just get very, I'm not going to get anywhere with a psychologically right. oriented interview. But, you know, that that being said, I've certainly... Um, encountered my share of unpleasantness and uh yeah <laughs> what was this? what was the question sorry <laughs> oh yeah i was i was kind of leading into another question but okay well i was just curious what was the sedative of choice that you used or your department used it really depends uh where you where you go so when i worked in nova scotia there was fairly rapid adoption of intramuscular olanzapine uh that's a medication that came out in the late 90s and is strongly favored even by individuals who get asked about their their sedating experience. Um, a lot of emergency physicians, they still like haloperidol, which has been around since the early 70s. They, it's got a very long track record, very long safety record. It's got predictable pharmacological effects. But individuals who get sedated or restrained with Haldol uniformly report it's an absolutely terrible dysphoric experience. Whereas olanzapine can be given as monotherapy or as a single drug, olanzapine often needs to be combined with a benzodiazepine, usually Ativan or lorazepam. And then here in Vancouver, for some reason, uh, I guess there must have been an extraordinarily successful uh, drug rep back in the 70s. But the, the medication of choice here is one that's called loxapine, which it's it's heard of, it's used in other places, but here it is as common as soup. And that ends up being the go-to antipsychotic for acute chemical sedation, often given together with, uh, with lorazepam. So the reason I was asking about the aggressive behavior, so the thing that led me to interviewing Dr. J for the last uh, podcast interview was... Mm you see a lot of bad behavior, viral videos online, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. including, including racist speech. And some of these people right. seem to me to clearly be, you know, in a few cases seem to be suffering from some mental uh, brain thing going on, you know, sure. based yeah. on incoherence or, or whatever, uh, illogical behavior and illogical right. speech. So in, in pointing this out online, I've had people say to me, well, even if they're suffering from some sort of condition that causes them to behave this way, there's, they still must be fundamentally deep down racist in order to say, you know, for example, racist things. And, and I'm curious, what is your thought on that? Because to me, that seems, there seems to be in situations where you wouldn't be able to attribute such things to how they really feel. And it's, it's the disease, but I'm curious what you think of that. Yeah. So, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll put it into a less contentious 
uh, framework that might help makes uh, make some sense out of it. When I was working in a, a forensic setting, there was an individual who was admitted on forensic remand because he had begun communicating online that he had an intention to assassinate the president of the United States. And believe me, that gets you noticed rapidly. Um, and so he was, he was, he was a guy that would just, he would go to work and he would turn wrenches and he would go home and, uh, he would get online and he would just start making threats against then, um, George Bush. And ordinarily these kinds of threats would just get you landed in some kind of criminal problem. But it became really clear when he got in front of a judge and they, and he was giving an account of himself that once he got into this world where he was talking about specifically about the president, that his reason, his rationale, it just fell apart. He became completely incoherent. His sentences didn't make any sense. His thought forms didn't make any sense. But then you'd get him back out of this. Well, where do you live? Oh, uh, 123 Lancaster Avenue. Okay, how old are you? I'm 26. So what do you do for a living? I'm a heavy duty mechanic. Okay, now tell me again, what's the, 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 the problem, you know, with, with George Bush? And he would just collapse. So it's this kind of fascinating police interrogation, right? And so at some point, somebody says, okay, maybe there's a psychiatric issue here. And so he ends up in the in the in the forensic service. And as he's recovering from his psychotic episode, which is just this very kind of purely discreet delusional, like disorganized delusional complex around George Bush, he becomes as mystified at this as everybody else. And he becomes horrified by what he's done and the circumstances that it has landed him in as he regains his insight. And so when an individual is, is saying or doing something in a state of, of psychiatric crisis, uh, all bets are off. Uh, I think I remember seeing one video that, that you and I discussed, and it was this little old lady somewhere in California, I think, who was approaching people and just saying just jaw-droppingly terrible racist things. And so you see her do this once and you think, wow, that's, that's really shocking and terrible. But then uh, another video emerges a few days later of her doing this. And it's almost the exact same script. And she even, she even at certain points starts speaking the same kind of nonsense words and syllables. Right. Yeah. When she gets to certain levels of agitation and she's, she's making the exact same kind of comments like, oh, you're, you're filming that? Yeah, you go ahead and film that. Put it on Facebook. Show it to the whole world. And, right. so and she one, even said, uh, I, I, I include that audio in the last podcast. She even says something like, we play games where we fuck you to death or something. You know, it's like, just doesn't make sense. You know, she just sounds yeah. you know, in, very incoherent. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah, so it's, it's over the top foul language and it's, it's logically incoherent. And there, there's, there's certain aspects when I'm approaching an individual, I try to imagine, okay, can I imagine myself in this set of circumstances? What would it take for me to end up in this set of circumstances? If I was an elderly person, if I was somewhat frail uh, and I had any shred of rationality, if I, if, I, if I hated you with just an undying hatred, I would also at the same time recognize how incredibly vulnerable I am in a situation. And I certainly wouldn't march up to strangers, all of whom are probably larger and stronger than I am, and begin saying these incredibly over-the-top, inappropriate, shocking, incoherent things. So there's an aspect of there of a complete loss of insight, in addition to just dreadfully bad judgment, plus the same kind of impairments in thought form and, and speech form, and then the same kind of collapse into these strange nonsense syllables at certain points in the interview. And at that point, I would be like, okay, is this a dyed-in-the-wool hardened racist who feels emboldened by the general rise of white nationalist sentiment in the U.S.? Or is this an individual who is in some significant psychiatric distress and is kind of rising like a boat in the tide? After seeing the second video, 
uh, the first video, I got a little suspicious. The second video, I was willing to bet everything I owned on it. Mm-hmm. And then a few days later, out comes the article. Yeah, this is an individual who, because of the coronavirus lockdown, hasn't been seen at her mental health clinic and has been off medication. And I'm like, not surprising. Not surprising. I always err on this side of uncertainty. So, you know, there's just so many types of psychological and, and brain disturbances and strains obsessions that people can have, you know, related right. to that. So yeah. Even if that video had shown her, you know, just a clip of a more coherent sentence that she had said, my fundamental stance on all these things before I know more is like, I'm not going to jump to a conclusion of, uh, you know, even if one sentence she said or several sentences sounded coherent, we just don't have enough information, right? Because there are, you know, and like you said, there's, there's other clues that can be present too. Like I, I definitely noticed that she was getting in people's faces and she wore a strange smile, which was almost friendly and, and bantering in a way, you know, there's, there's many indicators that can be present, but even without those indicators, we just don't know enough with the, and that's what bothers me about these, these reactions to these videos online, you know, no matter what it is, it's, we, we hardly ever have the context to right. know all the factors that are present, you know, whether that was, it could be, you know, and I'm not just, not just talking about racist behavior, but any behavior, it, it could be something that happened before the video we don't know about. It could be an angle of the video that makes it look like something happened, but it didn't. It could be, you know, mental condition, you know, it, it's just this unfiltered uh these unfiltered videos and audio that we get that we, everyone reacts to, it almost seems like wasted emotional and intellectual effort. You know, how many man hours are we spending on reacting to things that we don't have the context for, you know? Right. And well, I mean, in, in, in the case of say that, indi- that individual or an individual behaving in that way, uh, a big part of say treatment is going to be, so what is your recollection of what you said and, 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 and what motivated that? And what do you think would happen if you did that to the wrong person uh, to try and gauge whether they recognize the, the potential peril they're creating for themselves? Uh, and you hope that, that that improves over time. It reminds me of a case that I saw. It was, it's the only time I had to admit an individual under involuntary circumstances to the hospital, not because he was a threat to himself or because he was a threat to others, but he was panhandling so aggressively for several weeks in front of a biker controlled bar that eventually they said, if somebody doesn't do something about this guy, we're going to kill him. That's not exactly suicidal ideation. It's not exactly homicidal ideation, but clearly this guy couldn't be out on the street. And I was quite willing to take that to the review panel if it came up to it. But, you know, we had to bring this guy into the hospital and it took weeks and weeks and weeks to get him down and he never gained insight. So ultimately, we had to arrange for him to have accommodations just in a different part of the city so that he wasn't near that place where he was in grave peril. So speaking of the woman we talked about who was those videos, she specifically was focused on um, talking to Asian people and saying horrible things to Asian people. What kind of, you know, if you had to guess what kind of condition would, you know, lead to that kind of focused obsession on, you know, Asian people, for example? I mean, uh, you know, without commenting specifically on her case, but um, clinical details of that nature would tend to make me think of a chronic psychotic disorder. So something Mm -hmm. like a a chronic schizophrenia or a schizoaffective disorder or a delusional disorder. If I had to settle on one diagnosis, it would probably be along the lines of um, schizophrenia with paranoid features. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so it would come to pass somehow that she had some sort of obsession with Asian people through whatever, you know, whatever uh, her uh, delusions or, or, or belief systems led her to, she had some sort of obsession, yeah. Or maybe just didn't, maybe in the state of recovery, just had no thoughts whatsoever about the Asian community or Asian individuals. So it could have been a, a, a random a reaction of, of some sort that right. doesn't really make any coherent sense. You know? Yeah, ultimately, it's the, the, the explanations are always vague. There's, there's biological factors, you know, she had been off medications, there's psychological factors. She was probably not able to see her family, not able to see her recovery team. There's social factors. There's the big scary virus going around. Uh, There's no shortage of right-wing demagogues in the media quite happy to call it the China virus, quote unquote, or the Mm -hmm. Wuhan virus. Oh, right, right. So it's the environment. Yeah. I think that's what's lesser known too in in society is the way that culture and and the the things in the environment can be absorbed by people with mental 
issues. You know, for example, I was walking downtown in, in, in Portland, you know, um, maybe years ago now, a couple of years ago and heard a, you know, a homeless person ha- uh, talking to themselves, having some mental uh, issues. And they were basically mumbling about uh, racial slurs and uh, words for Hispanics and, and saying things like that. And, right. you know, it, I think there's this interplay between the environment and people with mental issues, like they absorb these things, you know, and, and, uh, and I think, and I think there can be a misunderstanding of, of the, the upswing in things, you know, from say from people with, with mental suffering from mental issues. The reason they're talking about those things is because it is in the environment more, you know, like you said, like maybe she watched some, this woman watched some TV and, and heard people mentioning China virus or whatever, you know, there's this interplay and it doesn't mean that, you know, I mean, it can, I think it's linked to philosophies in general uh, being popular, but these instances are, are more due to the environment, these people latching on to things they hear, you know? Yeah. Or, and, 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 you know, we all do it. We're all susceptible to, to being influenced by culture. Otherwise culture wouldn't be a thing, right? You know, we wouldn't all have wanted Air Jordans in the nineties to date myself somewhat, or, you know, uh, there wouldn't be such a thing as a pop star if, uh, if we weren't susceptible to more benign forms of cultural contagion or our dis- our conversations i think getting you know rougher and ruder because of trump you know like i've had mm. even, I've, i even had a conservative friend tell me that when she found herself saying things that she would never have said before that's when right. she kind of turned the corner and realized like wait trump is really affecting my speech and my thought patterns you know and that's what yep. made her into a, a trump you know anti-trump person right uh, right yeah that's a great example um and it's this is just natural we are are a, at least in some respects, a hierarchical species. And we sort of look to cultural examples. Uh, We look to politicians and celebrities as much as we say we don't. And as much as we hate ourselves for it, we do it. I do it. You do it. We all do it. Yeah. 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 Yeah, They affect us. Uh, I was, uh, I was thinking about a poker personality who he actually died uh, last month, uh, but he had had a YouTube channel where he talked about poker and it used to be a pretty normal channel. Uh-huh. Um, you know, he was a coherent guy and then he obviously was suffering from some uh, mental disturbances. And I guess, uh, you know, basically he, he, he documented his kind of downward spiral on, mm. on YouTube and he was, you know, going out and, and basically harassing people. And, and he would also say pretty horrible things about right. people on his YouTube channel. And, and he, he, he got arrested for making threats eventually mm. and uh, just kept going, getting worse and worse. And people were talking about it on, on the poker forums and, and okay. stuff. And um, I, I don't have a lot of knowledge about, I, I, I imagine it, it's something to, you would classify it as a personality disorder, I guess. And, and I'm curious how you see, because it seems it's hard to understand how someone can go from going down that path. Uh, would you care to talk about what personality disorders are and how they can, can come and go? Uh, sure. Well, um, so, I mean, the, from what you're describing, and I don't have any direct knowledge of it, it I would think it would probably be less likely to be a personality disorder mm. because personality disorders tend to be stable stable maladaptive patterns that are usually present by late adolescence or early adulthood. And they often have uh, predictable or predictably unpredictable ways of maladaptive coping in various kinds of situations. So an individual who was a particular way well into adulthood and then suddenly starts turning a corner, that's where I start to think, okay, is this a new onset psychotic disorder? Is this a new onset mood disorder? Uh, Is this a psychiatric disorder secondary to a hidden substance use disorder? Is there a medical condition at play that's driving this that's also not detected? Um, Those are all very live possibilities for an individual. But to get to your your main question, what is a personality disorder? Basically, it's a, a maladaptive and somewhat rigidly maladaptive way of adapting to the normal stresses of life that we all experience. So it's sort of like having, you know, we all have a tool belt of coping strategies to deal with uh, interpersonal conflict, to deal with internal conflict, to deal with difficult emotions. So we all regulate our emotions with a set of tools. We regulate our impulses with a certain set of tools. You know, your boss tells you to do something at the last minute and it involves staying late and you have this flash of anger at your boss and maybe you have a mental fantasy of 
punching him in the face. Well, you don't do that, right? <laughs> if you want to retain employment and your and your civil liberty, you refrain. Um, and you know, Freud talks about this in Civilization and its discontents and putting away base impulses is kind of the bargain we all make with each other in order to have civilization. And the one thing that we mustn't do is to so completely bury our impulses that we're all given to neurosis. So you got to kind of let things off the chain once in a while in, in safe and adaptive ways. That's civilization. It's discontents in a very thumbnail sketch. So the personality disorder is somebody whose tool belt is really, really limited. And they have maybe a certain limited number of ways of coping that get applied in lots of different situations. So somebody say with obsessive compulsive personality disorder is going to be the person who copes by breaking anything down into every, the detailed steps that have to be undertaken so that it can be undertaken perfectly. The problem is the plan gets so detailed and so bogged down that nothing gets done and it ends up being a disaster. And it ends up being this kind of repeating cycle of failure because of excessive obsessionality. Now, there are times where you need to be obsessive. If you are going on a long trip and you take medication, you check that two or three times to make sure you have enough medication and maybe some extra, and maybe you carry a prescription with you, and maybe you have some phone numbers if you lose your medication, right? So there's, there's adaptive levels of obsessionality. But if you get obsessive about, okay, well, you know, should I ask this person out on a date? And you list all the reasons why you should, and you list all the reasons why you shouldn't. And then you start deeply interrogating all of those reasons. And it's two years later. And meanwhile, that person is just, you know, now happily married to somebody else living the good life. Well, you missed the boat there, Charlie. And uh, it's that tendency to bring that limited coping set into different situations. And we break the personality disorders into what we call clusters. So cluster A, which would be the odd uh, and eccentric personality disorders. This is where we would have uh, paranoid personality disorder, schizoid personality disorder, and schizotypal personality disorder. Cluster B are sometimes referred to as the dramatic and erratic personality disorder. So this is where we find narcissistic personality disorder, which is that kind of excessive preoccupation with the self. And the self must be guarded and protected and valued above all other things at all costs. And then there's a histrionic personality disorder. Uh, I must be the center of attention at all times or else I have unendurable anxiety. And the only way I can cope with the anxiety is by re-seizing the spotlight. Borderline personality disorder also is in cluster B. And it's focused around attachment. And it there's intense fear of abandonment and its flight into and flight out of relationships, which become inappropriately deep way too quickly. And then also would be antisocial personality disorder, which is, um, that's a personality disorder that doesn't tend to cluster very well. It's just kind of this mixed grab bag of basically criminal traits <laughs> and all put together and called a, a personality disorder. Um, but it's not clear that that um, survives validity analysis. And then in, in cluster C, which we would sort of refer to as the, the sort of the sad personality disorder cluster, that's where we have dependent personality disorder. That's the individual who is just completely dependent on other people, can't make major decisions, has trouble with autonomy, with independence. In there would be the obsessive compulsive personality disorder. And then avoidant personality disorder, which is the kind of the, the polar opposite of the dependent personality disorder. So this is the person who has completely shuns and avoids attachments and doesn't bother um, and is very loath to make any kind of connection with other people. You could think of it as like either inverse of dependent or, or inverse of, of, of borderline, depending on which aspects of, uh, of attachment you're, you're kind of wanting to characterize. So for someone, say, that it was kind of going downhill and becoming more antisocial and, yeah. and incoherent suddenly, yeah. like in their 30s or 40s suddenly. Right. And it, I've had a hard time understanding how, how people go from being fairly coherent to, right. to not being coherent. You know? Yeah. So the fact that there was that coherency to begin with suggests against a characterological trait because traits mm -hmm. are longstanding 
and again, present by late adolescence or early adulthood, right? So if this is an individual who was a particular way and then really seems to turn a corner, that's when you want to start thinking about acute psychiatric syndrome. So is this a primary psychiatric syndrome or are there secondary drivers? And the two big secondary drivers are substances and other medical conditions. Mm. Um, and so somebody, especially say in their, in their mid thirties, um, I'm going to be wondering about, okay, you know, is there, is there a, a medical condition that hasn't been detected here? Because often that's an unusual age for uh, a new primary psychiatric diagnosis to, to come out of the blue. It does happen, but it's just less common. So I'd be somebody in that situation. I'd be wanting to work them up pretty thoroughly. So what's going on with your liver? What's going on with your kidneys? What's going on with your thyroid? Uh, what's going on with your electrolytes? Um, and then what, uh, you know, do you use substances? What do you use? How much do you use? Is that changing over time? Are you being honest with me? Are you being honest with me? And um, then once that's all excluded, then say, okay, well, this is probably, uh, if, if that is not there, then okay, this is maybe an atypical manifestation of a kind of a late or a later onset uh, psychotic disorder. And I guess you never know. There could be, well, I guess they'd find a brain tumor or something like that. You know, as, If there's an test. autopsy, yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's certainly something to think about as well. Yeah, yeah. As part of a... A comprehensive workup you know so, so if somebody's paranoid that's one thing but if they're paranoid and they're like oh i get these vicious headaches oh really tell me more about the headaches and uh wow you have one eye with a pupil slightly larger than the other is that long standing or is that new oh i don't even know well let's pull out your driver's license photo and have a look and there's you know there's just different ways that you kind of go down the path towards finding the diagnosis there's just so many so many things that can be true it's uh i imagine it's yeah. Do you, do you like that show, Doctor uh, or House MD? House. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, I like House, but I don't like the. I mean, I like House because it's good television. It's good drama. I do not like House because of the medicine. It's not okay, always. Okay. It's not always lupus. A. Um, and it's just not the case that you have this very tiny group of super talented residents who are doing absolutely everything on their own. And we're going to give the radiotherapy and we're going to do the brain biopsy and, and we're going to do the abdominal surgery and it's chaos. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they just do whatever they want. Yeah, 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 yeah. And eventually, you know, uh, it, it ends up becoming something really weird. Uh, and at the end, the uh, house is like, aha, red paint chips. And they're like, what? Yeah, this, <laughs> this guy this guy gets the weirdest patients. Of, you know, where, where, does, where do all these people come from? Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. All right. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, uh, I've taken enough of your time. It's, it's been great talking to you. This has been Dr. Rob Tarswell. And uh, what's the best way people can, can get in touch with you if they wanted to? I'd say uh, get a hold of me uh, Twitter at Rob underscore Tarswell. Great. He's got a picture of a, um, a, a brain scan on there because it's, it's impressive. Brain. Yeah, it's, a, it's an impressive uh, image. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> all right. Well, thanks a lot for your, for your time. You're welcome. Thanks for listening to the People Who Read People podcast. If you enjoyed this, please leave it a rating or review on the platform you listen on, if that's possible. If not, if you could share an episode you like on social media, that's much appreciated also. I make no money from this podcast, so sharing word of it and helping make it more popular is the main way you can encourage me to make more episodes. Hope you found it interesting.